Hello and welcome to today's noon conference co-presented by MRI Online and AAWR. The AAWR was founded in 1981 to provide a forum for issues unique to women in radiology, radiation oncology, and related professions. The association sponsors programs that promote opportunities for women and facilitates networking among members and other professionals. As well, AAWR strives to meet the diverse and changing needs of its members through mentorship opportunities for the next generation of women radiologists. You can learn more about their mission and membership at aawr.org. We're thrilled to partner with AAWR in these lectures as part of our shared commitment to advancing and supporting women in radiology and transforming the way radiologists learn and thrive. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Kagan Arleo for a lecture entitled, In Preparation for Women's History Month, Screening Mammography Saves Lives. Dr. Arleo completed her Diagnostic Radiology Residency and Breast Body Fellowship at Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City, where she's been on staff since 2010. She's currently a professor of radiology there and also serves as editor-in-chief of the radiology journal, Clinical Imaging. At the end of the lecture, please join her in a Q&A session where she'll address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Arleo, please take it from here. Hello, thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone who's joining us for convening for this noon conference about um, screening mammography in light of upcoming Women's History Month starting tomorrow. Um, as mentioned, I'm Elizabeth Arleo, professor of radiology at Cornell, where I practice breast and body imaging. And I am also uh, required to disclose to you that I'm editor in chief of the radiology journal, journal Clinical Imaging. <clears throat> you know, October in certain cer circles, certainly in radiology and uh, breast imaging and women's health is obviously all well known to us as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and currently, uh, for one more extra day on this leap year, we are in February, Black History Month. And as we look uh, forward to tomorrow, um, to March, um, it will be Women's History Month. And to tie um, this in with today's lecture topic of screening mammography, there are actually so many women who have made history who have also had breast cancer, including those listed here. And seeing all these known names and faces, I think this reminds us, it certainly reminds me that as we get ready to celebrate Women's History Month, to maybe also remember to celebrate screening mammography, because you know while it's far from perfect, it is still the best test we currently have uh, to save uh, lives from premature premature death from breast cancer. And so with this in mind, um, let's turn to thinking about where it can be helpful to take a step back and think, you know, a step back from the daily grind of the workstation, of the all the lists we have to cover to remind ourselves, you know, why we screen, why there are so many different guidelines and putting the risks in perspectives for ourselves and also our patients and providers. Um, because uh, not only in, in October breast, um, breast Cancer Awareness Month, but also potentially in Women's History Month, may we get more questions about this, uh, or, or really any day, it's, be, it's good to be armed with it. So, you know, first it's important to keep in mind that the benefits of screening mammography include, but are not limited to, significant decrease in breast cancer specific mortality. This is really important to keep in mind. Um, and in other words, why we screen, because to quote this 2021 JCR article about women at average risk for breast cancer, written by a number of colleagues and friends from the ACR Breast Cancer Screening Leader Group, I'm going to quote this article because I couldn't you know, say it better myself. So quote, the ACR and SBI recommend annual mammography screening beginning at 40, which provides the greatest mortality reduction, diagnosis at an earlier stage, better surgical options, and more effective chemotherapy. Delaying screening until age 45 or 50 will result in an unnecessary loss of life to breast cancer and adversely affects minority women in particular. Treatment advances cannot overcome the disadvantage of being diagnosed with an advanced stage tumor. And women who wish to maximize benefit will choose annual screening starting at 40 years old and will not stop screening. Amen. So um, 
The ACR SBI recommends annual screening starting at 40 and has done so for many years because of diverse scientific evidence supporting this, including considering each one one by one in brief, the randomized controlled trials, national population-based data, computer modeling, and international service screening data. So this slide shows a forest plot from a Lancet meta-analysis of every single randomized trial ever done studying screening mammography, demonstrating that the relative risk of breast cancer death in women invited to participate in screening was 0.8 or 20% lower in, than women not invited to participate in screening overall. Even number one, including the flawed Canadian trials, which flawed in that they did a clinical breast exam before assigning to women to screening or not, so not truly randomized. Number two, even though all the randomized controlled trials were done as early as the 1960s up to the 90s, so all film, obviously no digital, obviously no TOMO. And number three, even taking into account um, the inherent problems of randomized control trials in general, including <clears throat> the multiple reasons listed here, the most important of which I would say are number one and two, namely non-compliance, which means that women in the study group were, are invited to have screening mammography However, if a woman refuses to be screened and dies of breast cancer, she's still counted in that screening group, which minimizes benefit in the screening arm. And in contrast, in contamination, women in the control group who are not invited to participate in screening, but if they have a screening outside the, the trial, they're still counted as an unscreened control, which would artificially improve the mortality benefit in the non-screening arm. Does that make sense? I hope so. That's why when we look at national population-based data, we see an even greater reduction in breast cancer-specific mortality than is demonstrated by the randomized trials. In other words, as a result of the randomized trials, randomized controlled trials, screening mammography was introduced at a population-based level in the United States in the mid-1980s, and though it was not then, and is still not now, an official national screening program, within a few years, the death rate from breast cancer, which had been steady for decades, began to decrease as demonstrated on this slide. And specifically, this slide shows a 38% decrease in US breast cancer mortality from 1990, when the breast cancer death rate was 73.8 per 100,000 women to 2014, when the breast cancer death rate was 45.9 per 2,000 women. And two additional points about this. You know, um, Hong Kong uh, doesn't screen any of their women but has access to modern therapy and the death rates are increasing there in contrast to decreasing here. And however, unfortunately, number two, the surveillance epidemiology and end result program organizing this population data, this, the SEER registry, does not make note of whether with breast, no, does not make note of whether women with breast cancer were screened or not. This is obviously a major flaw. Um, Whereas data for international screening study service screening programs in other countries do have this information. And so when stratified by those who were actually screened as opposed to just invited to screen as in the randomized controlled trial, we see an even greater benefit, an even greater reduction in breast cancer specific mortality. Um, now here's this, uh, the same graph now just extended out to 2020, uh, just before COVID. Um, and so what about specifically for women in their 40s? Well, if one assesses life years, a very common metric for impact of disease, this JAMA 2015 article demonstrates demonstrating the distribution of person years of life lost due to breast cancer by age at diagnosis shows that, as you can see here, the peak is at age 45 to 49. And this meta-analysis of the randomized control trials focusing on data for women in their 40s specifically demonstrated a statistically significant 18% mortality reduction, reduction in breast cancer-specific mortality in women in this age group. Furthermore, younger women, including women in their 40s, tend to get more aggressive, faster-growing cancers, so they should definitely be screened annually starting at 40 instead of biannually or deferring start age to 45 or 50, as some organizations recommend, as we'll further discuss. So screening starting at 40 is further supported by meta-analyses, including this one based on case-controlled studies 
from service screening data from countries as far reaching as Australia, with some enrolling women in their 40s, demonstrating a 49% decrease in breast cancer specific mortality in those actually screened. And while regular screening mammography results in a substantial reduction in breast cancer mortality as summarized here, again, as the 2021 ACR SBI statement, you know, finally really explicitly states, which is why I quoted it, you know, mortality reduction is not the only benefit of screening mammography. And yet, unfortunately, the ACR and SBI are the only organizations issuing screening mammography guidelines to take these other benefits into account, including morbidity reduction, because screening mammography finds cancers smaller than they would be if detected clinically when palpable. Women have the option of smaller surgeries, lumpectomy instead of vasectomy, and potentially avoiding the toxic effects of chemotherapy. Furthermore, the detection of high-risk lesions is also an important benefit to consider because it may change how patients are managed. More on the guidelines for high-risk women later in this talk. And finally, the vast majority of women have a truly negative mammogram the vast majority of time, and being reassured as such is obviously enormously beneficial as well. You know, note um, perhaps in retrospect that I've been specifically saying breast cancer specific mortality, and this is a really important distinction from quote all co cause mortality, which this and other articles try to use to show that screening mammography doesn't decrease mortality. So this um, August JAMA internal medicine article concluded that quote, and this was looking at a meta-analysis of um, randomized control trials for many screening tests, not just screening mammography, uh, but including screening mammography. And the conclusion for all these different screening tests was, quote, the finding of this meta-analysis suggests that current evidence does not substantiate the claim that common cancer screening tests save lives by extending lifetime except possibly for colorectal cancer screening with sigmoidoscopy. Um, that's not my area of expertise, so I'm not gonna get into it here, but the point I wanna make is that it's futile to use all-cause mortality as an endpoint, especially when extrapolating from small randomized control, control trials, because you must either have to follow up for way beyond the observation time, or you have to have way more participants. In other words, if you did screening for, for ages 40 to 74, and looked at all cause mortality at age 50, you would need a randomized controlled trial of a total of 1.25 million women, total for both arms, to show that reduction of 2.2% all cause mortality, which only corresponds to a mild 18% reduction in breast cancer deaths. So the conclusion should have been quote, we are not able to detect changes in all-cause mortality because none of the trials are powered to measure changes in all-cause mortality, although the sigmoid sigmoidoscopy trials come close. Um, and life years gained should be a better statistic, but the pa this paper, this JAMA paper, calculates the lifetime gained. And in response to this JAMA article, the chief scientific officer of the American Cancer Society made the important point that these cancer screening exams have never promised to prolong an individual's um, natural lifespan, but rather to reduce premature death from cancer. In other words, again, fully you know, determining whether cancer screening extends a life would require an extremely large clinical trial that would have to follow patients for a very long time. And the trials in this newest study here Weren't, book, book, weren't big enough to look at all cause mortality. And the chief scientific officer said, um, quote, if a person's life expectancy at birth was 80, a cancer screening may prevent their premature death at, 80, at 65, but it wouldn't necessarily mean they live to be 90 instead of pre the predicted 80. No one is saying if you do cancer screening, you're gonna live to hundred years old. So I think that's really well said. So that's why we screen, <clears throat> which begs the question, <clears throat> which bags a sip of water. <clears throat> if the data are so overwhelmingly demonstrating the benefits of screening mammography, then why are there so many different guidelines out there? You know, making it unclear for patients and ordering providers alike what to do. 
Um, and to quote a, quote a unique leadership book that was recommended to me um, by one of my breast imaging colleagues at Cornell and first female chair of the American College of Radiology Board of Chancellors, Dr. Geraldine McGinty, she recommended this book by Brene Brown called Dare to Lead. Excellent book. And I particularly like this uh, quotation from it, which is that, excuse me, quote, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So I ask you, does this look clear? We have three different organizations with three different start and three different stop ages and three different frequencies. And as physicians, we want our ordering providers and patients to make informed, evidence-based decisions about their healthcare and not feel like they're you know, randomly throwing darts to determine which guideline to follow for something as important as a vital health outcome. And as I think most of us uh, already know, the ACR slash SBI, as I've been saying, the recommendation for years has consistently been for annual screening mammography starting at 40, which is in contradistinction to the United States Preventative Services Task Force, or Prevent Services, as some like to call it, uh, which is um, as of this spring, as of May 2023, biennial screening um, of women 40 to 74. But previously, since 2009, they were recommending biennial screening of women 50 to 74. And this is all also in contrast to the American Cancer Society recommendation for starting at age 45 annually, but then potentially transitioning to biennial at 55 or continuing with annual. And given these three different start ages, 40, 45, or 50, at intervals, one or two years, this qualifies, in my opinion, as unclear and thus unkind. And for clarity, uh, in 2017, as described in this publication in Cancer that I wrote with colleagues from the ACR Breast Screening Leaders Group, including you know real giants in the field that I was fortunate to work with, Sickles, Hendricks, Helvey, we used assistant computer models to compare the ACR, American Cancer Society, and task force recommendations at the time, where CISNET is the Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network. And under the auspices of the NIH, which is part of the US Department of Health and Human Services, the National Cancer Institute has funded CISNET to develop computer models about screening, including screening mammography. And computer models, although not without limitations as well, attempt to rectify some of the shortcomings of the data previously mentioned by applying consistent starting age is and consistent screening intervals, both within and across various models. And in some, the purpose of this study was to use CISNET breast cancer models to compare three major screening mammography recommendations for women of average breast cancer risk at the time the study was performed in 2016-2017. And <clears throat> the principal finding was that the greatest reduction, the greatest mortality reduction, not surprisingly, is achieved with annual screening starting in 40. A nearly 40% decrease in breast cancer-specific mortality associated with the ACR SBI recommendation um, in contrast to only a 23% decrease in breast cancer specific mortality associated with the task force recommendation of biennial screening women 50 to 74 and a 31% decrease in breast cancer specific mortality uh, somewhere in between for the AC American Cancer Society hybrid recommendation. And you know, presumably uh, the May 2023 task force updated draft recommendation of screening women 40 to 74 biennially, um, you know, the, you know, presumably their uh, mortality reduction would no longer be as low as 23%, but clearly it wouldn't be as high as the nearly 40% associated with the ACR SBI recommendation. Um, and a logical next step for research in the future would be to directly compare these recommendations, um, ideally with updated CISNET models. So given these three mortality reduction results, how can three different organizations have such different recommendations? In other words, how do different organizations come up with different recommendations if they have access to the same CISNET data, same CISNET models, the same randomized controlled trials, and the same population-based data? So the top reasons for this, I would say, are outlined here. Um, first, the task force focused its data review on randomized control trials. You know, the rationale being that uh, randomized control trials, as we all learned in medical school, you know, are the gold standard for research. And yet recall <clears throat> from this slide 
um, that the, the multiple reasons why the randomized controlled trials underestimate the benefit of screening in actual practice. So part of the difference in guideline has to do with the task force focusing on limited and older data. Second, both the American Cancer Society and task force only count one benefit, mortality reduction, and ignore all the other benefits of screening we've discussed, including those listed here. Yet the American Cancer Society and task force include all the risks, false positives, overdiagnosis, all of which are non-lethal. Third, not only that, but they, they being the task force and the American Cancer Society, focus on these risks and describe them as harms, as we'll get into shortly. And fourth, um, you know, it, undoubtedly, there are political and economic factors here as well. Um, you know, recall that from, from grade school or uh, high school, you know, and this is relevant for 2024 election year as well, you know, the three branches of the U.S. government, including the legislative branch, which is Congress, and the federal law requires Congress to produce a budget each fiscal year to set spending li limits, very reasonable. Congress, as we know, has two arms, the House um, and the Senate, uh, the latter of which has a Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, um, which oversees the Department of Health and Human Services, which oversees the NIH, which oversees uh, the National Cancer Institute, which funds CISNED. And the Senate also authorizes the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the AHRQ, to convene the task force. Therefore, trying to put all the, the arrows together, if Congress is required to limit spending, then they are going to understandably value recommendations which are fiscally more frugal, as the task force are, as demonstrated by this graph from a value-based care website based on 2010 data, looking at the annual cost of screening mammography by screening strategy and demonstrating the task force recommendation of biennial screening of, of 50, ages 50 to 74, not surprisingly, costs significantly less on the order of billions of dollars less than the ACR uh, SBI recommendation of annual screening mammography. And this 2010 bar uh, shows what was going on in actual pra practice in 2010, right after the task force announced its 2009 updated rec of biennial 50 to 74. So it shows the current, current at in 2010 practice at the time, in which screening, uh, which when which screening sixty one to seventy three percent of women, 50, forty to eighty four was actually going on. So clearly, there are political and economic factors influencing organizational guideline recommendations, um, according to uh, largely in part who is in charge of the organization. So for the task force, we, we looked at the, my my tree. That's Congress. Well, what about the American Cancer Society? And in preparing for this lecture, I got curious and I went down the rabbit hole, uh, looking it up and, you know, discovering that um, the American Cancer Society is, to, to quote their website, quote, a nonprofit organization that is exempt from federal taxation. Uh, uh, as this, uh, um, we ensure donors' money is spent as efficiently and effectively as possible. And apparently they, the American Cancer Society raises nearly all of its money through private individual donations, which, quote, helps to ensure our independence. But still, the question is who is making the decisions? And <clears throat> according to their website, the society, the American Cancer Society is governed by a single board of directors, which is made up of volunteers from the, both the medical and lay communities. And specifically, the board of director is comprised of five officers and 16 directors and the board is responsible for setting policy. So of course, I then had to see who the officers are. Guess how many physicians there are? One, the scientific officer, um, a hematologist oncologist from the Brigham. So that's it. And so since we're digging deep here into organizational structure and composition, because for the reason that it significantly impacts organizational policy recommendations, you know, for, for, for full, uh, for full, um, Digging deep, what about the American College of Radiology to balance it all out? So in brief, for completeness, as you may know, the ACR was founded in 1923. So happy 100th birthday last year um, with the stated mission that, quote, the ACR is the voice of our members, empowering them to service patients and society 
by advancing the practice and science of radiological care. And um, show of hands, how many of you are ACR members? Um, you know, the, the ACR is really our voice. And while I can't fit the whole governing board of chancellors in on one side, here is top leadership um, from the chair um, to the speaker, uh, obviously all physicians, all radiologists, and even if I may note, um, one uh, breast imager, uh, Dana, Dr. Dana Smetherin, who's chair for radiology uh, at Ochsner in New Orleans, and is gonna be um, the next, I believe I got the title right, chief scientific officer, uh, CEO for the ACR, so. So third, re-emerging from, from that rabbit hole and having considered why we screen and different guidelines, let's now um, focus on putting risks into perspective. <clears throat> But I'll take this uh, this section pause to take another sip of water. <clears throat> and um, we'll do this because I think we all get a lot of questions about risk from patients and providers alike, and we want to be able to sufficiently answer and address these questions. So along the lines of clear is kind, an important motto for me, I'm also really big on clear definition of terms. So if we clearly define the word harm used over and over by the task force as demonstrated on the next slide, I think it's reasonable to conclude that harm is too harsh a term for most of the sequela of screening mammography. And yet the original 2009 task force recommendation article moving screening mammography to biennial screening 50 to 74 uses the word harm, harms, or harmed a whopping 61 times. Specifically, the harms of screening stated by the task force include those underlined here, including psychological harms, false positives, overdiagnosis, and radiation exposure. I would say that the top three risks of screening mammography that we get questions about from patients and providers include false positives and overdiagnosis and radiation exposure. So I'm gonna address these one by one. You'll note on this slide that I purposely use the word risk, not harm, because in medicine, again, we talk about risk benefit analyses. We talk about informed consent, including a discussion of risks, not harms, risks, benefits, and alternatives. And verbiage is really important. So taking each of these one by one, starting with false positives, again, let's clearly define the term. A false positive is a test result erroneously indicating a particular condition. It's a risk of any screening test. It's not unique to screening mammography. And as we know, in screening mammography, it just means that patients you know, get a BIRAD zero or were called for additional imaging evaluation, a few additional mammographic images and or an ultrasound, usually to make sure everything is okay or if needed, close follow-up or a biopsy all of which is certainly anxiety provoking, but none of which I think it's fair to say can compare to the anxiety of dying for breast cancer as this cartoon suggests. <coughs> Instead, as this ACR infographic demonstrates, out of every 100 women who get a screening mammogram, 90 will be told their mammograms are normal, only 10 will be asked to return for additional mammograms or ultrasound, of which six will be reassured everything is normal, two will be asked to return in six months for a follow-up, that's our BIRADS three, and two will be recommended to have a needle biopsy, BIRADS four or five. It's shown another way at a larger um, you know, population-based uh, level for every 1,000 women who have screening mammography, only 100 will return for an additional mammogram or ultrasound due to something seen on the screen. 61 out of the 1,000 will have additional imaging and find nothing is wrong. 20 will find, will have found that, you know, whatever the finding was, was probably benign and be asked to return in six months for short interval follow-up. 19 will be re um, recommended for a um, needle biopsy and five um, will be, out of that, a thousand will be diagnosed with breast cancer. With that five being somewhere in the two to 10 per 1,000 screenings range, which is the, our performance benchmark for cancer detection and screening mammography, where within that, the, the, the range depends on whether it's an incidence or prevalence round. To get even more granular, this AJR article, 
which draws on data from the task force uh, publication, has quantified the risk of a false positive mammogram to be once every 10.2 years for a woman in her 40s and once in, once in every 16.8 years for women in her 80s. So if a woman has annual screening mammography starting when she's 40 and continuing for as long as she's in good health, this means she may be recalled from screening three to four times in her life. And to address the risk of radiation exposure, which is certainly a concern, we hear from patients on a regular basis as well, the risk of a fatal radiation-induced breast cancer due to screening mammography is estimated to be once in 76,000 to 97,000 for women in their 40s and once in too many years to estimate for women 80 or older. Next is overdiagnosis. So again, let's clearly define the term. Overdiagnosis is diagnosis of a disease by screening that would not have become symptomatic in a patient's lifetime or caused the death of the patient. And first, like, over, like false positives, overdiagnosis is not unique to screening mammography. It's a risk of any screening test. Second, overdiagnosis cannot, as you would imagine from this definition, be measured directly, leading to uncertainty regarding how frequently it occurs and a lack of consensus regarding how to estimate the magnitude. Third, by limiting screening, by delaying age of onset and or increasing the screening intervals will not impact overdiagnosis. And this is a very important um, and complex idea. And this last idea was the motivation for this study, which I conducted with colleagues from the ACR Commission for Breast Imaging, in which we surveyed fellows of the Society of Breast Imaging asking about biopsy proven breast cancer that didn't receive any treatment for whatever reasons and their natural history. And what we found was that not surprisingly, among nearly 500 untreated breast cancers detected on screening mammography, none spontaneously disappeared or regressed. And an unknown percentage of these cancers could be overdiagnosis. In other words, the indolent cancers that wouldn't go on to kill the patient or present clinically in their lifetime but because all untreated screen detective cancers were visible and still suspicious from malignancy at the next mammographic evaluation, delaying the onset of screening or increasing the screening intervals between screening should not reduce the frequency of overdiagnosis. And this is an important concept, I, I feel like, that not that many people understand. You know, stated another way, <clears throat> including the task force, if a woman starts screening at age 40, an overdiagnosed lesion could be detected and overtreated when she's 40. However, if this woman instead starts screening at 50, that same overdiagnosed lesion will still be visible and will still be detected and still be overtreated when she's 50. Alternatively, if she doesn't have an indolent cancer and she didn't have a screen at 40, she might be dead of the disease by 50. So this is why limiting screening by delaying age of onset, to sound like a broken record, or increasing screening intervals is not going to over and not going to impact overdiagnosis. But you know, patients may ask, or or you may ask, what about you know all the claims we hear that a high percentage of breast cancers are overdiagnosed? And <coughs> unfortunately, articles such as this one by Blyer and Welsh in the New England Journal of Medicine, now over a decade ago, a decade ago, can substantially impact public and sometimes medical perception with its erroneous claims of substantial overdiagnosis, accounting as this article claims for nearly a third of all newly diagnosed breast cancer. And this New England Journal medical article is one a such example of medical literature, um, you know, which is uh, not scientifically valid. And I, I'd like to show this uh, newspaper clipping in, the, in this era of alternative facts and post truth to make the obvious point that you shouldn't just blindly believe everything you read. <clears throat> there is disagreement over the extent of overdiagnosis in breast cancer screening, for sure. But the case for high rates of overdiagnosis rests on analyses such as these by Blyer and Welch that were biased by lead time and erroneous incidence trend, trends. And when properly analyzed, data from both randomized controlled trials and service screening studies re retrospectively respectively, excuse me, indicate that the rate of over overdiagnosis of screening mammography is more like 10% or less. And here are just two reputable studies showing this um, decade after decade, including this article from Politi and colleagues from 2012, 
looking at European service screening data with scientifically valid literature, concluding the, that the most plausible estimates of overdiagnosis range from one to 10%. And this is a more recent article in radiology in 2017 by Dr. Hendricks, looking at US data and also reporting a sub 10% overdiagnosis rate. And circling back to the earlier discussion about harms, I would say that the real harm is if women don't get screened because of concerns about false positives or diagnosis, because then they run the risk of underdiagnosis, which can be fatal. <clears throat> to that point, at my institution at Weill Cornell, we've also published a study looking back on all screening mammograms 2014 to 2016, with the primary endpoint of determining the rate of detection of breast cancer and associated prognostic factors in women 40 to 44 and 45 to 49 years old. And what we found was that women 40 to 49 years old had overall an 18.8%, were actually 18.8% of all the screen detected breast cancers that we were seeing. And the two cohorts, 40 to 44 and 44 to 49, had similar incidences of breast of screen detected breast cancer, 8.9 and 9.8% respectively, and cancer detection rates within performance benchmark standing standards supporting a similar recommendation for both cohorts and the ACR recommendation of annual screening starting at 40. Furthermore, over 60% of the cancers in this 40s cohort were invasive, so clinically significant disease. So if we didn't screen women in their 40s, we'd be missing about 20% of our cancers, which again would be significant under diagnosis. <coughs> Um, on the other side of the age span, you know, in news about overdiagnosis, um, this is an article, um, again, from August of 2023 in the um, Annals of Internal Medicine. This article um, is from Yale, my alma mater. It's about screening mammography. So I was curious to see, you know, if anyone in that division uh, wrote it, because um, I know the people in that division, and more, I guess, after next than after a Cornell. And in fact, no one... Um, none of these names were familiar at all. So when I looked at the authors, because uh, I wasn't even remotely familiar with any of their names, it turns out that they come from the section of general internal medicine um, and a, a, the Yale Cancer and Research Center, obviously of international reputation, but again, not with, with not a single breast imager involved. And I say, uh, you know, again, for this too, because if you look at the composition of the task force, its members, again, are from multiple disciplines, but not a single one as a radiologist. And uh, the other thing of note here is that its conclusion also uses, note, the biased word harms, stating that, quote, overdiagnosis may be common among older women who are diagnosed with breast cancer after screening. Um, and it's really in contradistinction contra contra dist to our experience in clinical practice, again, at Cornell, where we also reviewed screening mammography exams at our institution from 2007 to 2013 with the primary endpoint of determining the incidence of breast cancer and associated prognostic features in women 75 years of older. You know, the task force says there's insufficient evidence um, to recommend for or against screening in this age cohort. So we wanted to provide some evidence based on our, re our real clinical experience, you know, in comparison with the SEER data based um, that was used uh, in the internal medicine uh, article uh, shown here. So <clears throat> from 2007 through 2013 at Cornell, 68,694 screening mammography examinations were performed. And of these screening exams, 4,424 were performed in patients 75 years or older. On the basis of these exams, biopsies of cancer is found this corresponded to a breast cancer detection rate of 5.9 per thousand screening exams, which again is compatible with performance benchmarks for screening. And approximately 85% of these screen detected cancers in women in this over 75 cohort were invasive. So again, clinically significant disease. You know, as an epilogue, several years after this 2012 infamous New England Journal of Medicine article was uh, published by uh, Blyer and Welsh. Uh, Welsh actually had to resign from Dartmouth amidst a plagiarism scandal, and yet the New England Journal of Medicine still refused to retract his article. You know, I think as, as a side note, this both bo begs the question, how does this happen at the level of our nation's highest level of medical journals? 
um, such as the New England Journal of Medicine. And I definitely, as editor chief of clinical imaging, interested in this, um, th this topic, a whole other uh, conversation. But I'm definitely uh, as interested as we think about how articles um, become published in peer-reviewed journals and, um, you know, the highest levels then go on to impact not only medical, but also lay perception. You know, despite this, while Welsh is still uh, at it in terms of attacking screening mammography, um, with this article that appeared just in September 2023, um, which among other things, um, so he, he's talking about the new, this is the 2023 task force recommendations moving um, biennial screening from 50 to 74 to 40 to 74. Um, again, taking my, wearing my editor's hat, there are no references for many claims in this articles. I assume this is to satisfy the five reference um, uh, limit of the the perspective uh, column, um, you know. I uh, but it leaves definitely leaves me wondering how it passed peer review if claim after claim is unsupported or if there was any peer review. Um, the article, the perspective piece, decries the models, but <laughs> says them else, But then also uses them repeatedly to make the points. Um, so this is some of the uh, many problems here, but. Um, I digress. Anyway, as a final note about the risk of uh, radiation-induced fatal cancer from annual screening mammography from ages 40 to 80, it's estimated to be a max of 25 per 100,000 women or 0 0.00025. And a risk, this risk is obviously far smaller than the current NIH estimates of lifetime risk of developing breast cancer for women, for American women, specifically According to the NIH, based on current incident rates, 12.4% of women born in the U.S. will develop breast cancer at some time during their lives. This estimate means that if current incidence rates stay the same, a woman born today has about a one in eight chance of being diagnosed with breast cancer at some time during her life, which percentage-wise corresponds with a 12 to 13% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And this means that higher than average risk is anyone with a greater than 12 to 13% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. And specifically, as we know, the ACR defines high risk as 20% or greater lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. So, you know, what are the latest ACR SBI recommendations for women in this cohort? It's good we're talking about this now um, because uh, this is a relatively due um, since last uh, Women's History uh, Month. This is a May 5th, 2023 JSC article with table one listing uh, main actionable genetic mutations associated with an increased risk of breast cancer in alphabetical order from ATM to BRCA to TP53. And table two from this article takes specific populations at risk and compares the prior with the current 2023 ACR SBI recommendations. And the three main changes I'd like to highlight are number one, that genetic mutation carriers and their untested first degree relatives can wait till 40 to start annual screening mammography if they start annual screening MRI at age 25 to 30. And I'm definitely seeing more and more of this with the increased number of high risk screening MRIs I'm reading where there may be a genetic mutation carrier in her late 30s say with multiple prior MRIs, but no mammogram. You know, I'd be curious to know if that's what others are seeing clinical practice. Number two, for women with dense breast tissue, the current recommendation is for annual MRI or as an alternative, contrast enhanced uh, mammography or ultrasound. And I'm going to come back to this because in a few slides because this is a big statement for MRI. And number three, all women should have a risk assessment at 25 instead of 30, which really makes sense since some women need to start imaging screening at 25 to 30. So they should know this by 25 if they're going to start on time. You know, what we hear from many of our patients, of course, is that they don't have any known risk factor. So why should be they, why should they take on any of the previously aforementioned risks to which it can be um, helpful to recall and remind that while some risk factors are modifiable and others cannot, some cannot be changed, the fact of the matter is that 60 to 70% of patients with breast cancer have no connection to these risk factors at all. So um, even if they don't have any risk factors, they should still be screened. And finally, circling back to number two here, that for women with dense breast tissue, the current recommendation 
now includes for annual MRI. You know, the question I wanted to throw out there for uh, further research or further uh, thought after this new lecture is, and, and I don't know the answer, but um, is this reasonable or feasible recommendation when 45%, um, nearly half of US women over the age of 40 have dense breasts? On the one, on the one hand, maybe yes, this is a, you know, a scientifically valid recommendation to optimize early detection because we do know that MRI is the most sensitive. On the other hand, how many women would this actually be? Or asked another way, from our perspective as breast imagers, how many MRIs would this be for us to read? So to this answer this question of, of how many women are in the US um, ages 40 to 80, in fact, so I looked at um, census data from 2021, and if I add up um, you know, all the, um, the women 40 to 44, 45 to 49, 50 to 54, et cetera, um, I take my word with the math, this is 65 million women in the US ages 40 to 80. And if 45% have dense breasts, this corresponds with 29 million women with dense breasts or 21 million MRIs annually. Yikes. So my next question is, how many breast imagers are there in the United States? Allowing for the fact that obviously we're not e evenly distributed across all 50 states and not all breast imagers read MRI. And the best estimate I could find was from this 2005 AJA article, a portrait of breast imaging specialists, which states that the highest estimate of number of breast imaging specialists at the time, approximately 2,800, um, that was the number. So that's 2025, nearly two decades ago. Fast forward now to 2024. Even if this is rounded up to 3,000 and double, that's still, that's 6,000. You know, these are my back of the envelope um, uh, calculations. That would still mean 29 million MRIs divided by 6,000 um, breast imagers. Um, this would be 4,833 MRIs per breast imager um, per year. So that sounds like an awful lot to me. I don't know about you. Um, and, you know, just uh, it, taking a full view at the look of um, breast density issues um, and associated insurance, you know, no, this is not a political map uh, for the 2024 upcoming election. Um, but rather a map which demonstrates that as of this year, 38 states and the District of Columbia have some form of breast density notification legislation at a mammogram. Although not all laws require that a patient be informed about her own breast density, some laws only require general notification about breast density, and some state laws are more similar than others, um, but there's no state-to-state -state standard from state-to-state -state on what patients exactly are told or how they will be performed. And furthermore, it's not like all 38 of these states have associated appropriate um, insurance. You know, even if there is a state insurance law, are all women covered for supplemental screening for dense breasts? And the answer is resoundingly no. A state insurance law does not necessarily apply to all policies within the state. Um, for instance, self-funded plans, out-of-state plans, and national insurance plans may be exempt from state laws. And then what about all the women without insurance? So, you know, we're circles as fast to the beginning, you know, um, looking forward to Women's History Month, again, starting just to remind us and that, you know, we still really need continued research to improve women's health, health outcomes, access to healthcare, including for breast cancer, so that more women's lives can be saved and more women can make history in the future. And with that, Having considered everything on the stated agenda, I'll conclude and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for sharing your lecture today. At this time, we will open the floor for any questions from our audience and you can submit those through a, that Q&A feature at the, at the, uh, in the Zoom box. Um, Dr. Arleo, if you're able to open up that Q&A feature, if not, it's okay. I can read any that come in. Please, please do. I'm no yeah. one about that IT aspect. Not a problem. Um, no question yet, but you did get a compliment if you want me to read that out loud. <laughs> uh, thank you for all the time and effort in this that this must have required. The information you provided will be very valuable in advising patients and informing fellow clinicians going forward. But I'm glad if it reached, you know, one person and their patients and providers, then it's a worthwhile hour. 
I guess I actually have a question uh, that that uh, sort of reminds me is if we have people in our lives who it's time for them to to get screenings and they're adverse to doing so, do you have any tips to help convince those folks to do this or? It's such that- a it's such a good question. You know, I started studying screening mammography. Uh, when I was a fellow back in 2009 and I was in my early 30s and I thought, oh, this is great. You know, like I'll study the literature, do some research. And by the time I hit 40, you know, this will, uh, will this all be figured out. There'll be no more controversy. Well, I'm in the second half of my 40s now and obviously this still is going on. But what I like to say um, to women in my cohort or friends and family are, um, well, depending on the, on the person, what I think they will respond best to. There was actually a study out of NYU in New York City, the first um, author is Jian Lee, and she looked at approximately 500 breast imagers across the United States, um, the vast majority of which, uh, you know, happened to be women. And the question was, you know, if you recommend to your patients and the ACR, SBI recommendation of annual screening mammography starting at 40, do you yourself practice the same thing? And 98% of breast imagers not only um, recommended this, but also personally practice that. And I said, and I I would be one of them. I mm. wouldn't miss a single year um, for both, you know, the professionally, <laughs> here, you know, here's all the professional data, but um, and also personally as, as a woman, I wouldn't miss a year. And so I recommend the same thing for um, my friends and family. And, you know, that personal connection and personal recommendation, knowing that you have all the data in the world, like, how are you sort of sifting through it and come, what are you doing for yourself? I think, you know, that can be impactful. Yeah, I love that. Excellent. Okay, so we have a couple of questions uh, in, in clinical nature here. So where are we in using AI generated density estimation in practice? Um, such a good question. Um, you know, I think it's variable across states and institutions for sure. I think the important point is, um, why this question is so important is like how, you know, what's the downstream ramifications of using, uh, you know, AI quantitative based, um, density measurements will it more objectively and consistently one hopes, um, define what is dense versus not dense, and then be better able to, you know, define the, the the quantity of this cohort, and then think more realistically about what's feasible um, for, you know, fair access to women in this dense cohort. Gotcha. And how about new abbreviated rapid breast MR protocols? Is that going to change the equation for MRI utilization? I, I, I think so. I hope so, for sure. I mean, just anecdotally in my institution at Cornell, I feel like from month to month, even week to week, I'm seeing more and more um, high-risk screening MRI. And as we have more, we're only doing them in a certain cohort, uh, like inpatients with a prior full negative MRI. But as we have more of those and more of those patients in our past, as we get to the present, we're doing more and more abbreviated um, MRI and it's faster to obtain, it's faster to read. And I still rarely come across a study where I'm like, oh, I wish I had the full protocol. Mm -hmm. So if it's, um, if the technical fee of time and the professional fee of interpretation are both shorter, then it's gonna, you know, going back to the economics of this. And um, I used to feel like I have to apologize to talk about economics and healthcare. And that's just the reality in which we practice. Um, then it's going to cost uh, cost less. And if it costs less, then hopefully it will be available and accessible to more women. Yeah, for sure. Have you heard about any bills that may be moving through states regarding screening now that the USPSTF recs were out last summer? Can you repeat the question again? It's, I, it's a good one. It's a complex one. Yep. Sure, sure, sure. Have you heard about any bills that might be moving through states regarding uh, screening now that the USPSTF recommendations were out last summer? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't know, uh, and can't quote anything specifically, um, but I will say that there certainly are like, um, you know, private insurance laws that may then, um, or have in the past um, contradict what um, you know, Medicare has to cover, 
Um, and depending on the state level, one may override the other. And also, whereas I mentioned, there are 38 um, states in the country with state level breast density notification laws. There also has been a bill at time at the federal level about breast density notification. So I think if that were to pass at the federal level, how a bill, a federal bill about breast density notification interacts with, you know, the task um, force recommendations given that we saw that all comes down from um, the federal level, Congress, the Senate, et cetera, I think will be very interesting to see. You would hope that there would be um, consistency across recommendations <laughs> and insurance coverage for access. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yes. Did you did you experience an increase in patient callbacks when you were making the transition from film screen mammography to digital mammography? Um, a very good question. Um, I feel like I'm just at the what well, one that was sort of like over ten years ago, and I was sort of at the cusp of the transition. So I can't answer that specifically based on data. I know that the FDA approved you know, TOMO in 2011 slash 12. And I'll say that in, 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 in adopting TOMO, so which is sort of like, first we adopt, went from film to digital. And then the next big step, maybe like a decade later was from digital to using TOMO. I definitely think there was, you know, a learning curve in that first year or so. As with TOMO, we saw more and didn't have the previous TOMO uh, to compare it to. Um, and yet, ultimately, over the longer term, and now it's been over a decade since um, the FDA approved TOMO synthesis, you know, the, clearly the literature has shown that um, 3D TOMO synthesis mammography um, not only decreases the recall rate, circling back to the specific question, but also importantly, increases the cancer detection um, rate. So I would um, hypothesize that during the transition from film to digital, there may have been, you know, a transitional period in, in which there were increased callbacks, but that ultimately the benefits of digital um, ha have certainly outweighed that for many reasons, including um, the, the ability to have prior screenings because it's all digitally logged. And studies have shown, there's a great study out of UCS, UCSF by um, first author Jessica Hayward, who was a um, Cornell, uh, trained at Cornell as well. And she taught, she, in this study, they talk about um, that if there are two or more prior screening mammograms on file, um, the rate of recall, you know, significantly decreases. So I would say just from the aspect of digital cataloging, um, mm. that would be, you know, having digital over film could potentially decrease recall rates overall. Right. Thank you. All right, we've got two more for you. What do you recommend for women with dense breasts who are underserved by mammography? I'm not sure in what sense underserved is um, meant. Um, I, I'm just very transparent with, you know, women, if they come back to my office I, and I will show them their mammogram and I'll just, you know, I'll explain like, do you want to see your mammogram? Yes. Okay. Well, your mammogram is an x-ray and breasts, um, you know, it's an x-ray and, and we all have, you know, fat, which looks black, black and the fibroglandular parenchyma or the breast tissue looks white and a, a, a mass or a tumor could also look white. So you can see here, like if it's a complete white out, extremely dense breast, like it could be hard, uh, like it could be a limited test and that we might not see something growing in there because it would be totally obscured. Most people totally get th that idea. So I said, I will say, you know, to supplement this um, for women of average risk, we can perform supplemental screening with ultrasound, with benefits of which there are, you know, no additional radiation. Now, of course, there's some insurance issues which complicate this, um, but I will, um, I, I will say to them, like, I, I can't speak to all the, you know, insurance and financial concerns. I completely understand, understand these are valid concerns and we have to answer them. However, from my perspective as a physician, I just want to, you know, show to you the scientific evidence and the rationale behind you know what a test can and can't do so that you the consumer understands the benefits but also the limitations um and i'll say like and for myself personally um i do go ahead and get supplemental screening because i also have de dense breasts 
I don't say that with everyone, but mm. I feel like if that personal um, discussion is going to take it to another level and put it over their edge and put a patient over the edge and it's going to be beneficial for the healthcare, like I don't, I, I just go ahead and tell them because that's what my goal is as a physician. Yeah, that's great. Okay, one more question. Uh, can you recommend articles or books for BIRADS breast density estimation? I have been researching on it with no yield on step-by-step -step instructions. Um, good question. Uh, not off the top of my head, but circling back to one of the early questions about like the use of AI um, and de dense uh, breast density uh, estimations. You know, if I were to try to go answer this question as I get off this talk, I would go to you know PubMed um, and look for review articles uh, in the past five years on this topic and see what came up, and then you know look at the at the sources and go with a you know high impact journal. And I think that would be a good place to start. Awesome. Well, thank you. We got through them all, and thank you so much for your lecture again. That was excellent. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, happy leap year today and happy Women's History Month starting tomorrow. Absolutely. Yes. And thanks everyone else for participating in this new conference and for, for all your great questions. You will uh, you can access a recording of today's conference and all our previous new conferences by creating a free MRI online account. We'll also email out the replay later today. And be sure to join us next week on Thursday, March 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern where Dr. Mark Gosselin will deliver a lecture entitled Pulmonary Thromboembolic Disease, Challenging the Conventional Wisdoms and Algorithms. You can register for it at mrionline.com. Follow us on social media for updates on future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.